Australian journalist Michael Ware was on the front lines with Hezbollah during the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 2006. He experienced the fury of the IDF from the ground and saw their abilities really from the pointy end. This was after the capture of two Israeli soldiers. It was his first assignment for CNN at the time. Michael has also dealt extensively with the elite Iranian Revolutionary Guard, which is currently backing Hamas. Join me live now. Now, is Sky News con contributor Michael Ware. Michael, uh, good to see you. As I just went through your extensive, extensive uh, knowledge and you've seen this up front, um, the brutality of the attacks from Hamas and the expected fury from Israel, does any of it surprise you? Well, I, I guess it does surprise. I mean, we all woke up to complete surprise in the aftermath of the beginning of this attack, but I, I guess it doesn't shock me. I've seen what all sides in this conflict are capable of and understand that in Israel, they are calling this their 9-11. Mm. And for the number of Israelis killed to the, their total population, the percentage is even greater than the number of people per capita that America lost on September 11 and 2001. So you can be assured that the full and mighty fury of the Israeli Defence Force will be unleashed, but at the right moment, because right now that moment hasn't come upon us. Given the hostages that Hamas has taken them, has taken. That gives them a shield and a buffer. That complicates any sense of a ground invasion or a ground incursion beyond belief, because sh should the Israeli military, which right now is massing on the border of Gaza, head into the Gaza Strip, then among the first people who will be killed will be those hostages. So the Israeli military right now really does have one, if not two hands, held behind its back. And I've seen what they're capable of. In Lebanon, in the Bekaa Valley, the stronghold of Hezbollah, I witnessed what I think is the closest I'll ever see to carpet bombing as massive explosions marched up and up a valley towards us, devastating everything in its path. That's the capability of the Israelis. Yet I've also seen them put a missile as precisely into an apartment window, smaller than the one that's sitting next to me right now. But on the other side, as I saw with Hezbollah, I witnessed the enemy's ability to regenerate, replace and repair. As quickly as a bridge was destroyed in Lebanon, it was rebuilt the next morning. And you know that Hamas has been waiting for this. But the particular brutality of these attacks, of this operation, mm. have set a flame within Israel that's not easily going to be quenched and... As far as, as Tel Aviv sees it, there needs to be righteous vengeance. Yeah, that's right. And they've made that very clear today. You're right to say the, the next, I think, uh, escalation and a serious escalation will be a ground invasion by Israel into Hamas. But I spoke to an IDF a Defence Force uh, spokesperson barely an hour ago live on this program. So it was just after 1am and he was at pains to point out that that is a not when, it's still an if at this stage. So perhaps a, a small amount of mercy there. But he also pointed out that there was around a 1,000 Hamas militants who were able to breach that Israeli border he says the IDF killed 400 of them. Some of them still hold, you know, primary positions and military positions near that border. And some Israelis are still being taken hostage within their own uh, country, and within their own homes in many ways. So uh, that is, uh, I guess, a, a degree of complication for Benjamin Netanyahu because he has promised um, retaliation here, mighty retaliation, as he puts it. I have no doubt that that will come. But the question is when, Michael? Well, that's the great unknown right now. And it's because of these hostages. You know, 
the immediate impulse of the Israeli military would be to punch back and punch deep into Gaza. They have stated that their intention now is to completely dismantle the Hamas organization. But you can only do that on the ground. But you can't go in on the ground mm. while they're holding as many as, as 100 hostages. We still don't know the total number. There's reports that some of them are Nepalese, some of them are Thai, some of them are Americans. So that's going to hold the Israeli Defence Force back. And until they can identify where the hostages are, until they can figure out a way to rescue them, until they can negotiate some sort of solution, it really, really constrains the Israelis' ability to fight back on the ground. And trust me, they want to. Everything you've heard about this yeah. dance festival, it, 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 it still doesn't portray what... It, must have really been like on the ground. I've been listening to some witnesses. If you can, it's the summer music festival season. Imagine splendor in the grass at Byron Bay, and suddenly from four or five directions come heavily armed, well trained suicidal fighters just mowing everybody down, using rocket propelled grenade to tear mm -hmm. people apart, stabbing them up close and personal. And as the survivors fled, if you look at the terrain, there's nowhere to hide. The only cover was in a small forest or, or date palm plantation. And the people who fled there just buried themselves face down in the ground. One woman talked about how she heard the militants walking around her going pop, 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 executing anyone they could find beneath a palm tree near her. And then a vehicle pulls up and rearms those militants so they could continue executing anyone they found. And according to this one witness's story, the Israeli Defence Force must have been so busy in the 22 other areas where Hamas had invaded or incurred, uh, got into Israel... Mm that no one came to help them. And she just had to lay there for hours, hiding and pretending to be dead. Yeah, it's just horrific. Uh, we had a representative from the embassy uh, saying that her grandparents are still hiding in bomb shelters at the moment. She had friends at that music festival and it's really, really difficult to get your head around when it's, you know, young people in the prime of their lives. But what about the the politics uh, of all of this. This is more than just Israel, Palestine. We now have reports, Michael, from the Wall Street Journal, uh, perhaps unsurprising, uh, but bold in its confirmation, essentially, that Iran uh, gave the imprimatur here uh, for this attack. We know that Iran has been a, a long-time financial backer, really, of Hamas, don't we? I can't confirm it, and I admire the boldness of the Wall Street Journal, but I will still tell you for a fact that Tehran would have had to green light this operation. Mm. This operation has been grotesquely successful, and it has been incredibly well executed, and it has been in the planning for years. And Hamas would not exist were it not for the support from Tehran and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. At least 70% of their income comes from Iran. Their military expertise comes from Iran. The, the way that they can build entire rocket factories underground comes from expertise that is shared with them from Tehran. Hamas would not have done this without Iran's approval. Hmm. And don't forget, Hamas is attacking from the south. On the northern border is Hezbollah, yeah. who is also funded and armed and trained by Iran. And Hezbollah has what we estimate to be 150,000 missiles. Now, so far, they've only fired a few as a symbol of support. They obviously have not yet joined the fight. But what troubles me most deeply 
is that right now, I don't believe that we know what the real end game of this operation is. That's right. This Can I quickly ask the, you about Iran? Barely then? the prelude. Um, we need an hour to talk about this, perhaps all day, uh, Michael. But if Iran gave the imprimatur, gave the green light for this to happen, and we have Israel on the other side saying that they're going to essentially leave no stone unturned, at what point? does Iran become more directly involved? And what does that mean? Well, Iran is already directly involved. I, I can tell you now, from, from my very bones, there are Iranian Quds Force officers in Gaza as we speak, helping direct this fight. And the broader strategic objectives would not only have to have been approved by Tehran, but would also have to align with Tehran's regional interests. That's why I say we still don't really know what this is about. The mere fact that there was rocket barrages, then there was ground and air and sea assaults, and there was massacres, and then there was hostage taking, and then a few more missiles, and now it's all but stopped. They're now targeting Tel Aviv's airport. They're targeting this, but they're not continuing the missile fight. So, effectively, it looks like to me that stage one is over. They've been planning this for so long. <laughs> There's more stages to come. And we can only begin to guess what their ultimate end game is. Uh, particularly grim. Michael Ware, always good to talk to you. We'll be speaking to you a lot over the coming days. Thanks so much.